Thank you very much uh, for that very modest introduction. There's no chance I could ever live up to those. Uh, the only reason I have any ideas is because I, I have a new job. I'm called a technology harvester, and I sneak in the labs that uh, Jacques and Miriam and the rest of these people are doing, and they tell me what the future is going to look like. So what I'd like to show you here and please fasten your seat belts, we're gonna to have to go relatively fast, is what's gonna happen over the next 20 to 50 years in the trajectory that we see today in robotics. Uh, this is my disclosure slide. Uh, this is the first section up until about uh, the next uh, 10, 15 years, uh, near-term stuff that's in the laboratory that's likely to happen. The fundamental concept at this stage of the game is that because we're in the information age, and if you buy into the fact that a robot is not a machine, but it's an information system, like a CT scanner isn't a machine, it's an information system with eyes. The robot is an information system with arms and legs. Then you can integrate these together as Luke was very nicely showing the incredible progress that they have made. And so the idea is that we are going to look at the robot not only to enhance our capabilities, but also to allow us to integrate what we do as surgeons in a single place, which is the robotic workstation. With laparoscopic surgery, it was the first time that you did an operation without looking at your patient, and robotic surgery was the first time you operated on a patient without either looking at them or touching them. You looked at the information, which is the images on the screen, and you moved your hand, the information went and cut for you. And now we can take these capabilities and do open, laparoscopically, uh, minimally invasive, and in the future, notes or whatever kind of surgery, uh, remote telesurgery. Luke showed us the progress we have in image-guided surgery, preoperative planning, surgical rehearsal, and we can also add to this uh, preoperative warm-up and surgical simulation all at the robotic workstation. This is its strength. Another concept is that we're gonna to try to move away from physical objects. This is a key component of the information age that we haven't done. Whenever you can replace anything that's physical, like a tissue or instruments, with either information or energy, you've been able to dramatically increase the effectiveness of what you're going to do. For example, we started with High, uh, with standard Doppler ultrasound, and now we're adding high-intensity focused ultrasound. And when that yellow dot went on, it was able to coagulate the center of this bovine lens without causing any damage peripherally. The military was interested in this because they were able to demonstrate that we can combine diagnosis and treatment in a single instrument. Here we have this combined instrument, and here's the Doppler being turned on. And this is a pig. Now, they just lacerated the internal iliac artery. This pig dies in 15 minutes. You either have to operate on him, or you can press the button on the HIFU, and you can coagulate the tissue to stop the burning. And when you put the Doppler on, you notice there's no more bleeding. We've been able to stop internal exsanguinating hemorrhage without a single part of surgery. Sound familiar? Somebody is wounded, they've got a lacerated liver or spleen out on the highway, the medic runs up, goes mm, zap, and the patient's cured. Star Trek? No, it's not. It's what's coming to our research, out of the research lab, and available to us within the next decade. Uh, I'm not going to spend any time on notes just to, but rather to, to let you know, I think it has a, an important part, which would probably be in bariatric surgery. But I am not 100% certain about the other areas that it's going to have its role. However, we would like to support them with new technologies. Uh, this is a small grasper. Notice it's 0.7 millimeters, less than a millimeter in size. Uh, we can manufacture these for $3.50. They are etched out of silicon the same way that we etch computer chips out on MEMS technology. And we can literally make virtually any shape or any instrument. And so we're looking at this new generation of MEMS level instruments, which are a millimeter or less in size. Um, there are a number of companies, one of which I happen to observe at Stortz, uh, whom I work with, and this is a laparoscopic sewing machine in a early prototype. Uh, do we need sewing machines? I don't know, but we can have them if we want them. They're available in the 
research laboratory, and if we want to develop these, my view is that within the next 10 years, we can have whatever size we want. And they, we'll be able to put them both on the end of laparoscopes as well as flexible endoscopes. Next slide, please. And the next generation of uh, robots, I have been trying to make an operating room with no people. Uh, we have the Da Vinci robot. We have a smart bed that we call the Life Support for Trauma and Transport. It's an information system that senses everything about the patient and sends that information to the robot. Instead of my scrub nurse, I have a uh, Mitsubishi arm with a tool changer. And instead of my circulating nurse, I have a uh, off-the-shelf quick grip pharmacy dispenser of medications that we've modified to dispense surgical supplies. And this is the way it would work. Uh, the surgeon at the robot council says, two old chromic cat cut. And the scrub nurse goes over, pulls out the tray with the common grab cut, holds it out for our surgeon. He removes it from the tray. And then the you know, scrub nurse puts it back, and the surgeon performs his job. If he says, scalpel for the right hand, the scrub nurse grabs the new one, removes the old one, and replaces it with a new one, and takes the old instrument and places it back. Tool change time or uh, new supply time is approximately 11 to 17 seconds. Accuracy on this is four sigma, 99.97% accurate, which compares to my nurses. Uh, aren't your nurses that good? I've got some of the wonderful. Next slide, please. We'll, uh, may I go to the next slide? I, I want to bring to your attention CyberKnife. You may know about CyberKnife, but what's new about CyberKnife is they take the big helmet that sprays radiation <clears throat> and put um, a proton beam on the end of it and accurately position it. And on the other robotic arm, they have a table with the patient on it. The combination of the two allows them to get somewhere between point, point 0.3 and point 0.5 millimeter accuracy. They can kill tumors with a margin of 0.3 or 0.5 millimeters, which is pretty good, probably as good as I can do and maybe even better. And if we start doing some of the work that, once again, Luke has been doing with molecular imaging and doing data fusion and feeding that into the x-ray machine, we'll be able to take care of solid organ tumors as they are now doing at Loma Linda University. Rather than doing them with surgery, we will actually uh, coagulate or vaporize the actual tissues and take out the lymph nodes, preferentially just those that are involved. We need to be involved with this. I think the radiologists are looking for people to team up with. I know there are a number of new hospitals that are beginning to build this. So I want to bring this to your attention, uh, particularly to the surgical oncologists, because in the far distant future, we may not need to operate on any cancers, but rather we may use this as our primary modality. So that's what is available. It's coming out of the laboratories as we speak, and we need to decide whether we want them or not. Here are some other ones that are further in the future, if you will. Our icon isn't the robot anymore, but it's tissue engineering regeneration and some of the other new technologies. I've shown this before. The cockroach with the probe in its brain that runs on the treadmill, and the researchers <coughs> examine on the computer what the brain pattern is, and then interpret that to make their robotic systems more proficient. Uh, we actually had a researcher at night snuck back to the laboratory, disconnected the wire from the, uh, from the computer, hooked it to a joystick, and was driving the cockroach around the laboratory with $5 million of my taxpayer money. Uh, interestingly enough, if we'd have had uh, these tiny little cameras like the ones that you've got inside of your cell phones attached to, say, maybe 100 or 1,000 of these for uh, Haiti, uh, for the World Tower, we probably could have sent these cockroaches places that people and dogs can go. We probably could have found hundreds, if not thousands, of people that were trapped and then be able to get to them. So there may be some practicality to this. Uh, this stimulated, back in the early 1990s, the idea of... <coughs> mimicking insect-level uh, devices uh, and making micro-robots. Um, I'm not going to uh, uh, speak to this because Alfred Kushiri has made enormous progress. He's got a spectacular video to, and a lecture to follow me. But this is just to tell you that even though we started with nothing more than swallowing a pill instead of doing an endoscope, we are looking at ways to make these tiny, tiny little independent devices, if you will. There are a number of... Uh, 
projects out there. Uh, I, I will not go over all of them, but just to let you know that there are a number of different projects out there, most of them over in Europe, but some of them here in the United States, that are looking at making tiny robots. We're not, we're not talking about watching the movie 1972 Fantastic Voyage. We're talking about surgeons and engineers working together to build these tiny little things. And one of the concepts that uh, Alfred came up with this. These are so small, maybe what we're going to need to do is change the role of the surgeon from an analogous of that of, say, like a warrior that goes in and kills the cancer to the general that stops back and puts a bunch of, a squad of robots. And now he has to become a general instead of a warrior and actually rethink the way he does surgery by conducting each one of these. One will be a camera, one will be a light source, and one of them will be a coagulator, one will be a scissors. And we'll actually have the swarm of these together at microscopic level working to do what a surgeon normally would do as an individual. But more of that from Alfred. Femtosecond lasers. If you pulse light very fast, it's called a femtosecond laser. If you shine it on the membrane of a cell, you can make an incision and reach inside and begin operating. Mitochondria, Golgi apparatus, and even inside of the nucleus, removing portions of chromosomes. So 20 to 25 years from now, you as a surgeon may become a genetic surgeon, reaching inside the nucleus, removing bad genes, and putting the specific gene in to replace it. Why we're injecting viruses in people's bodies to do that, I'm not sure, because the future you may be doing it yourself. And the interesting thing is our cell biologists are working from a computer workstation that's almost exactly the same as the da Vinci that we're using today. And you're going to have to retrain, because if you're going to do cellular surgery, this is what you're going to see. And when you operate, and you change some of the proteins or some of the membranes in there, you can't tell the change in the structure, but you can change of color. Because as proteins change their figuration, their reflected light changes. Or maybe you'll be looking at the surface of the cell and trying to get that protein down the ion channel. I just want to bring to your attention, we have to th rethink the way that we're doing and look outside of what we're doing today and embrace our molecular biologists and our cell biologists as well with an operating room that looks something like this, in which we have a capability, because of the robotic systems that are in place, to operate either taking out entire organs or go all the way down to as small as genetic engineering from one place. That's the surgical robotic workstation. We need a new operating room. Oops, sorry, wrong operating room. Perhaps we will. Uh, uh, the University of Twente in the uh, Netherlands is now looking at a possible new interface and instead of actually sitting and squatting over a console, they want to put you in an exoskeleton and actually track your, not only your hand motions, but your entire body motions. And in allowing you to sit down and have full capabilities, perhaps they imagine we would use a head mounted display instead of looking into a television screen and then you would with gestures, just like you do with your iPhone today, manipulate the images and be able to actually control the entire motion, the arm motion as well as the hand and finger motion of the robot, simply by it tracking your motions with the robotic exoskeleton and then sending that information directly to the robot. And finally, the, the other way that we may be is as we get smaller, we can think about how things are going to happen, but we may not be able to actually do that with our hands. But with the brain machine interface program, they put probes in the brain of the monkey. And like in the cockroach, they were able to trace his patterns as he moved the red dot to touch the green dot. And then they disconnected the wire from the computer, hooked it to a robotic arm that was feeding them, and we now have five universities with families of monkeys sitting in front of computers thinking about eating and having a robotic arm feed them without them having to move. They were a little bit more successful when they, ex next slide please. I may be finished. I just wanted to show you the clinical applications of that. We now have quadriplegics with probes in their brains that are simply thinking, moving their robotic arms and actually being able to start doing things for themselves just by thinking. So these are some of the directions that we're gonna be going in the next, uh, 20 to 50 years, and I think it's an exciting journey. We have to ensure the quality of the research, 
We have to make sure that it's safe for our patients, and we have to decide whether or not we even really want to do this. Thank you very much.